And the first and original, you know, the, the first Rasta was Leonard Howell, who was the one who started up Haile Selassie in 1930, when he was crowned. And he was the one who really started to talk about the, connecting the prophecies of Marcus Garvey, because he was a Garveyite, with the crowning of Haile Selassie. So Leonard Howell was the first Rasta. And out of the Howellites came the Nyabengi order. It was the first order of Rastafari. And, um, you know, you may have heard the, the Nyabengi chanting. Boom, 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 boom. And then chanting on top, you know, the heartbeat. That's the Nyabengi chanting. That was the first order of Rastafari. Out of the Nyabengi came the Bobo Shantis. Because they, they, they took an even more pure form of Rasta. They were the Levites of the movement. And they developed the Bobo Shanti house. <coughs> And then, and then also then came the 12 tribes through another, tradi through another tradition, through the Ethiopian World Federation. So it was kind of a, a, a different development that the 12 tribes came out of. And unless we understand these kinds of things, I think then we can't really know Rastafari properly in this country because of the different reasonings and the different traditions and doctrines there are within the different houses. And, it's, and as I say, it's my regret that we don't have more than one mansion in this country. Um, <coughs> And as a result, and because the 12 tribes was really based in Auckland, uh, as a result, people all around the country have had no access to a house of Rastafari. And even in Auckland, for those of us like myself, who, who, didn't, who wasn't a part of the 12 tribes, who was more, more a client, inclined to like a Naibingi approach to Rasta, you know, there was, there's no house to attach to. So... How do we learn the history and how do we learn the traditions and the practices of Rastafari? If you live in, in Porirua, you know, if you live in Christchurch, how do you find out about Rasta? Well, of course, we do it through the music. So we listen to Bob Marley and we listen to Winston Rodney and we listen to culture and we listen to, you know, the Abyssinians or whoever and, and we listen to that music and it's telling us. If you listen, it's telling you, not vaguely, not in general terms, in clear detail about the history. Who was po Paul Bogle? Bob Murray sings about Paul Bogle. Who was Paul Bogle? You have to go look it up. He was a slave rebel leader. He led a slave rebellion, you know. Um, who was Sister Nancy? Who were the Arawaks that culture sings about, you know, that were exterminated from the Caribbeans, which is why there was black slaves imported there in the first place, because the Spanish committed genocide on the native population. You know, this is the stuff that Ruth Rasta Reggae is, is talking about. And you listen and you learn our history. And you learn about the Nyabingi and you learn about the Bago Shanti and whatever. And, you know, and the 12 tribes reasoning. You, 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 you listen to the music. But today, because one of the problems is that most of the reggae singers, they don't belong to a house. They don't come from a house. And lucky examples like Shay, who grew up in the house, has that knowledge. But most young reggae singers never grew up in a Rasta house and have no access to a Rasta elder. Bob Marley was reasoning with Mortimo Plano and then putting that message through the music. If you're a young reggae singer in Aotearoa today, how do you know? It comes out of your head, you read the Bible, and maybe you listen, but there's no direct transmission. And, you know, and so it makes it weak and it means that the music lacks substance, inevitably. You know. So we don't know our history. Um, you know, uh, there's a lack of guidance from elders, there's a lack of wisdom from elders. So all these things in Rastafari history, Pinnacle, which is where, where Leonard Howell established the first Rasta community, and is currently now being sold off to developers in Jamaica, and there's a campaign in the international Rasta movement to save Pinnacle from big American corporations coming and building a hotel and apartments or whatever, you know. This is a side of Rastafari heritage, you know, and most people have never even heard of Pinnacle, never mind the the movement to try and save it, you know, or back a wall, or any, you know, any of these things. There was a band back a yard, but the name comes from back a wall, which was there was a rusted place, and it was bulldozed by the authorities, you know. So we don't even know this kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happens then is, is because there's no access to the to the true knowledge, Rastafari becomes um, trivialised. because people cling to the the signs about dreadlocks and smoking guns and we fly the colours. <clears throat> but there's no true tradition of, the, and the fact that Rasta is a modern 
expression of a more ancient lineage, going back to the Essenes. And you know, you read the you read the rules of the Essenes, and they're the same as like the Noabingi order. You know, th this is an ancient tradition of the Nazarites that's being expressed in this time. You know, so um, yeah, so but we don't, you know, so we 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 focus on the on the on the style rather than the liberty because we don't know what the liberty is, and um, you know, and and then it just again it just becomes a way of making money. It's great. Babylon loves um, the commodification of of Rastafari. And, you know, it was a board talked about the society of the spectacle, the way the capitalist society will um, turn any genuine expression of resistance into a commodity. So you no longer are, are an active participant, you become a passive consumer. So punk rock, you can go, you know, which was like, do it yourself, is now you can go and get your hair done, and, you know, reggae, you can go to the hairdresser and spend hundreds of dollars to get dreadlocks put in your hair. For something you can get by throwing your brush away, you know. And the reality is that a true rust of liberty is not good for capitalism. Because you're not going to buy more, you're going to buy less. You're going to grow, you know, you're more likely to grow your own vegetables. You're more likely to walk instead of take a car, you know. You're more likely to do, do with less. You, you live a simpler life. That's a rust of liberty, you know. That's an ITAL liberty. And so that's not good for Babylon, you know. And so, of course, um, the commodification, well, you know, Babylon loves that. And there's money to be made there. And so a good example in this country is the Ragamuffin Festival. You know, there was a conscious reggae festival happening in Raglan for years where they were bringing out the freshest reggae stuff, Junior Kelly, people like this, as well as old school, big youth, third world. Conscious, they had a, a really good environmental focus on the, on the event. You know, it was a community organisation that set up, it was Cornerstone Roots and their motherland collective who, who ran this festival for years, and basically they were put out of business the last straw when Matt Ragamuffin came over, where some Australian promoter who, um, who doesn't give a fuck about reggae, excuse the language, but really doesn't give a fuck about reggae music or Rastafari, and sees a dollar to be made in it, and brings out covers bands you know, I mean, I've seen the Whalers play a couple of times, and respect to the Whalers because they did some amazing music, but watching the Whalers for right now is like watching a covers band playing covers of their own songs because they've been doing it for so many years, and I'm sure they're producing amazing new music back home, but we're not seeing it because when they tour as the Whalers, you know, it's like they're doing the same stuff they've been doing for years and years and years, and UB40 and people who have done nothing fresh for decades, you know, and they're making... And so they put Soundsplash out of business and they're making money and people are flocking to it. And a friend of mine, a Russell friend of mine was saying, he was there and he said to someone, oh, kia ora, bro. And they're like, no, today it's not kia ora, it's ja Rastafari. And so he said, Selassie I. And they go, huh? Eh? <laughs> what? <laughs> Who? Yeah, what? You know, and so that's, that's kind of the level of consciousness that we've come to, the commodification of Rastafari, you know. And... Um, and so I think, you know, we really, I think it's really time we have to start to fight back against this. And there are things that are happening, you know, as well as the 12 tribes are still in Auckland, still, still flying the banner, still holding the dances. I was there at the HQ, you know, um, a week or so ago, still, still, still trotting the child, you know, and much respect to that. And there's other things going on as well, you know. So, um, so there's this magazine, Selassie, Sister Sonia here has been putting it out for many years. And um, continues. It's now volume four, issue one. She has some copies. If you want to hear about Rust, read about Rastafari for, for real in Aotearoa, you can pick up this. It's got some really good stuff, really good articles in it, and it's just a core, you know. So, so there are there are works now to try and bring a to bring the tradition again into other places that the twelve tribes aren't reaching, you know. And we have the United Rastafari of Aotearoa organisation. We're trying to start up to say Rust of different of any mansion, of all mansions or no mansion, can come and get together once or twice a year to reason together, to learn from one another, to learn our history, to learn our chants, to learn our culture, and start to uh, unify so we can build a Rastafari movement again in this country. And the other thing, just lastly, that I think is really interesting is because this connects in with an international movement, there's a um, World Intellectual Property Organization uh, and there's, a, there's an article on their website put up in April this year by a Jamaican lawyer who's working with the, 
uh, Millennium, Rastafari Millennium Council to start to try and protect Rastafari intellectual property rights. Because even though Rastafari is not recognised legally as an indigenous culture, because it didn't exist before colonisation, nevertheless, and I see it as an indigenous mm. culture. And um, mm. so they're looking at um, working uh, with, the, with the World Intellectual Property Organisation to protect Rastafari traditional cultural expressions and traditional cultural knowledge. Um, because there's all these people making Rastafari staff pictures of His Majesty, flying colours, and none of that money ever goes back to the Rasta community. And more importantly, to the elders. There's, there's elders of the movement who were the ones who, who broke the ground in this trod, who are living on, you know, a bag of lentils a week. You know, poor, poor in Africa and Jamaica. And so, you know, and I have to start talking about how we can start to support some of those ones as well. So, this, so there was good developments happening. Um, but it comes back to the question the sister over here asked before, you know, about, about um, the dangers of this and, and you know, um, yeah, for me, I think that um, the heart of Rasta is really strong. The message of Rasta is more appropriate now for the world today than it, than it ever was because it's the challenges that we face, the fabric of life is unravelling before our eyes. The social systems are breaking down, the financial systems are in crisis. Rasta has a message to create a better life for all people through the government of the poor, by which we mean a government of simplicity, of all of us, we govern ourselves in simplicity. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to start to make that message clear again. So, okay, thanks for the time. Mm -hmm. So, God, it's a blessing to you.